In working with young adults affected by Asperger's over the years, I've noticed that a lot of these individuals tend to struggle their way through life and have adopted an attitude of learned helplessness. This phenomenon occurs when the young adult with Asperger's or high-functioning autism comes to believe that he has little or no control over his life and that whatever he does to try to change a bad situation is pointless. As a result, this discouraged individual will stay passive in the face of any unpleasant harmful or damaging state of affairs even when he actually does have the ability to improve his circumstances. Hello everybody, this is Mark Hutton and today I want to talk about learned helplessness in young adults on the autism spectrum. Learned helplessness can be thought of as believing you are incompetent, that you have no control over the outcome, and that it doesn't matter what you do since outcomes no longer depend on actions, and that your actions are pointless. To qualify as true learned helplessness, the phenomenon should meet the following three conditions. The person has to become inappropriately passive. This change has to follow exposure to uncontrollable events, and there is a change in the way the person thinks about her ability to control similar future events. The person's rationalizations and self-talk go something like this. Adopting a passive stance provides me with a sense of control over my life circumstances. Beating my head against a brick wall wastes time and energy and is potentially harmful. Hope has its limits. Persistent attempts to control the uncontrollable are futile, and remaining passive allows me to conserve energy when the evidence tells me there is simply nothing else for me to do. Asperger's adults with learned helplessness tend to have an external locus of control. For example, I have no control over what happens to me. And they also tend to view unwanted outcomes as permanent. For example, because I didn't get hired for this job this time, I probably won't get hired for any other job ever. Research shows that explanatory styles are primarily learned rather than inherited. You learned how to explain bad things from three main sources. One, you learned your own explanatory style from major life crises. If you experienced a crisis, for example, a house fire, divorced parents, bullying, poverty, and so on, you noticed if those major life stressors got resolved after a short period of time or if they persisted for a long period of time. If the crisis got resolved quickly, then you learn to believe that adversity is specific, temporary, and can be overcome. On the other hand, if the crisis expanded and never ended, you learn to believe that adversity is permanent and pervasive. Two. You modeled how your mother or father explained adverse events. If your parents tended to blame themselves or you when bad things happened, you probably noticed and learned this pessimistic style. And three, you learned your explanatory style from the other adults that cared for you, disciplined you, taught, or criticized you. For example, teachers, coaches, and other authority figures. When these adults blamed your character or personality whenever bad things happened, you quickly learned to blame yourself using personal, permanent, and pervasive explanations for why things go wrong. Now, the style you learn for explaining adversity typically persists throughout adult life, but you can learn to dispute your pessimistic explanations. If you tend toward pessimism for adverse events, you can learn to dispute your own reasoning and adopt more objective, accurate, and optimistic explanations. Remember that in blaming yourself for all bad outcomes, for taking 100% of the blame each and every time, you are accepting a fallacy of disproportionate responsibility. Generally, many causes contribute to each result, outcome, event, or incident. For example, the causes contributing to an automobile accident may include choice of route, choice of time and schedule, choice of vehicle, design of the automobile, design of the road system, driver attention, driver preparation, driver training, maintenance of the automobile, manufacturer of the automobile, obstacles, other cars and drivers on the road, passenger behavior, pedestrians, traffic signals, weather conditions, and numerous other factors. So as you can see, there are many causes that contribute to each outcome. So it's going to be important for you to be objective when assessing blame or taking credit. Divide the responsibility for the bad result or good result evenly among all those involved in the situation based on how their inactions or actions affected the result. Maybe you have to take some of the blame, 
Maybe you deserve some of the credit, but it's unlikely that you or they are 100% responsible for the outcome. Become your own defense attorney. Re-examine the evidence. Challenge assumptions. Consider other possibilities and offer alternative explanations. Let's use an example of a job interview to illustrate this concept. You didn't get the job following an interview, so you automatically blame yourself and say to yourself, I'm just not any good at making a good first impression. So as a result, you feel ashamed, perhaps even depressed. You certainly feel discouraged and, and maybe overwhelmed. Well, now is the time to recognize that you are not helpless. It's time to dispute your hasty, inaccurate, and pessimistic conclusion. What does the evidence say? Certainly you've made a good impression in your lifetime to get where you are now. You were able to make at least a few friends over the years who liked you and wanted to spend time with you. You won them over by making a good first impression. This evidence clearly disputes your pessimistic belief that you are never any good at impressing people. What additional contributing causes are there for you not getting hired based on one job interview? Maybe you were upset about some recent problem, for example, a fight with your lover, your car broke down or whatever. Maybe you were under unusual stress or needed extra help from a job coach. Maybe you didn't prepare adequately for the interview or just didn't get a good night's sleep the night before. Maybe the person conducting the interview was looking for someone with a specific set of skills that you simply didn't have at the time. With so many factors at work, it's inaccurate to attribute blame entirely to yourself. And it's certainly an overgeneralization to extrapolate from this one occurrence to a general pervasive and persistent conclusion. A more accurate explanation is that you did poorly on this particular job interview for some isolated reason. For example, poor preparation, lack of experience with interviews, fear of being underqualified for the job, and so on. This isolated problem can certainly be overcome, and there's no need to feel ashamed or helpless. So you're going to put this setback into the past, you're going to address any specific issues, and you're going to go about preparing for the next job interview. So take responsibility only for what you did and what you can change. Can you tell me what your greatest strength is? I think it's my quick thinking and decision making. There have been many times when I've been under pressure and made the right decisions. 